Hello, my name is Melissa Silvis of Melissa Silvis Ministries, and this is week two in our five-week study on the principle of integrity. I believe that spiritual integrity, the consistency of it, is one of the greatest things that's lacking in the body of Christ in modern society. Let's face it, the world encourages people to behave badly, that when people push you, that you need to push back. But that's not what spiritual integrity says. Spiritual integrity encourages us instead to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves to God, and to understand that our real enemy is not people. Our real enemy is Satan. And Satan wants to destroy the life that God has for us, the life that God desires for us to walk out, the divine destiny that God has created for us that's going to bring him glory, that's going to build his kingdom on earth, that's going to advance the spiritual progress in this world of what God wants to do so that all men can be drawn toward God. We don't realize how when we compromise our integrity that we also compromise our opportunity. That we compromise our opportunity to draw people to the God of the Bible, the Jesus Christ of the Bible, the Jesus Christ that men encounter face to face in the Gospels. People are supposed to be encountering through you and me. But if we do not walk with consistent integrity before the world, spiritual integrity, then we are playing into the hands of the enemy that people don't even really know who Jesus is. And if we behave badly often enough, they think, what do you have that I don't even need, right? I had people tell me that when I was very young in the Lord, and I would say to people, you need Jesus. They would say, I've seen the way that you treat people, and I don't need anything that you have. But when we walk in a life of integrity, we're able to be spiritually generous, kind, patient, loving, not easily provoked and wounded, not unforgiving, Look, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how people treat us. It's that we won't be pushed around and manipulated and controlled by those things. A person who walks in integrity does these things. They are completely honest. They're honest in what they do, what they say, and even in the things that they think no one will ever really know about. They're still honest. They don't cheat on their taxes. They don't steal little things from work. But instead, they're honoring God in their actions and their attitudes because they know whether or not man sees, God always sees. God always knows. And a man or woman of spiritual integrity, they are accountable to God. And one day we will all stand before Jesus Christ and we'll give an account of the life that we lived either to build his kingdom or not. A man or woman of integrity also has strong moral and spiritual principles. They are consistently displaying the character of Christ. Before you open your mouth, online before you click post, tell yourself internally, you don't have to say it out loud unless it helps, but it's always helped me to say, God, I want to do this for your glory. If there's anything you're listening to, anything you're watching, Anywhere you're going, anything you're doing, anything you're mulling around in your head, anything you're carrying in your heart, that you can't say, God, this is for your glory, then you are compromising your integrity and you need to repent. You need to get rid of that stuff so that you can walk in a right relationship with God, displaying always the character of Christ. Doesn't mean we're perfect. But it means that we do everything we can to fully submit to God and to obey him every day. And that when we do get it wrong, uh, we immediately take responsibility and say, it wasn't because of what that person said or what that person did, me. I choose. I choose what I say. I choose what I react to. I choose the person that I look at in the mirror every day. And whether or not they walk in total integrity that is always honoring to God. A man or woman of spiritual integrity is whole and undivided in their loyalties to God. It says over and over again in the word of God, what part does the kingdom of light, does light have with darkness? That we need to be in the world, not of the world. We've got to have both 
feet in the kingdom of God. James talks endlessly about a double-minded man. A double-minded man is divided in his loyalties. He says, if asking God for something will work, I'll ask God. But if it doesn't work in five minutes, I'm going to come up with something else. We saw last week in our first week when we be built the foundation uh, leading up to the life of Joseph, we looked at his mom, Rachel. She was desperate to have a child. And so she blamed her husband. She complained. She envied her sister. And she even tried to manipulate the situation by giving her handmaiden, her concubine, to her husband to sleep with so that she could get sons that way. But nothing satisfied her. Nothing pleased her. Nothing took care of that hole in her heart. Until it says in the word of God that God remembered Rachel. Now, it wasn't that God forgot about Rachel, but what it means is God turned his attention toward Rachel. And, and why? It goes on in that verse to say, because he heard what she said. Rachel cried out to God, and that was one thing changed in her life. All of the manipulating and deceiving and jockeying for position and pushing people out of the way and playing games the way that the world does to try and achieve things, it's never going to work. And you're going to compromise your integrity along the way. You're going to have a reputation, and it's not going to be one for honesty. It wasn't until Rachel had some integrity that she came to a place where she decided she wanted to please God that things changed and God was able to open up her womb and she had Joseph and of all of Jacob's children now we don't know that much about Benjamin because he was very young when we read about the life of Joseph but of all of the 11 oldest brothers Joseph was the youngest and yet he was the one with the most integrity the most honesty the one who was not divided in his loyalties trying to do what he wanted to please himself or to get what he wanted the last thing we talked about last week was reuben joseph's oldest brother we don't know quite why but for some reason reuben decided that even though he was the firstborn even though he had the birthright even though he was going to be the one who was going to receive a double portion of his father's inheritance that instead he made a power play and he slept with one of his wives, uh, his father's wives, one of his concubines, um, to try and usurp his father's authority. We see this in the kings of Israel, how King David's one son slept with some of his wives and it was to try and set himself up as king to say, I've usurped the king's authority and now I'm going to be the new leader of this nation. And so that's what Reuben was doing. But it didn't work. And Israel punished him by stripping him of his birthright. So Reuben was no longer considered the firstborn legally. He was no longer going to get that double portion of his father's inheritance. And instead it fell to the only other firstborn legitimate son. And that was Joseph. I wonder how Joseph's brothers felt about that. Reuben um, was the firstborn, and all of the other brothers along with Reuben, they all hated Joseph because their mothers had not got along, and their mothers had raised them. Aaliyah specifically had raised her sons to hate Joseph. And so there was this great division. And now his inheritance goes to the brother he doesn't like. I wonder what that did to Reuben. And there was this great division in their family. Look, even when you do the right thing, even when you walk in integrity, doesn't mean everything is going to be peaceful and quiet and great between everybody. But it means that it's going to be peaceful and right between you and God. And sometimes that has to be enough. And in fact, it needs to be enough. Because like we looked in the word of God in Proverbs last week and saw that God says that when a man's ways please him, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Joseph could have ran around trying to do what his brothers did, behaving badly and trying to please them. And he could have worn himself out and they still wouldn't have been happy with him. But instead, Joseph chose to live a life that was honoring to God. And so the last thing we looked at was Reuben being stripped of his birthright and it being given to Joseph. 
And Joseph was already his father's favorite. But now there was an even greater uh, opportunity for Jacob to treat him with favoritism. And unfortunately, it was a compromise to Jacob's integrity. Of all of the men in Joseph's family, he was the only one who walked in absolute integrity all the time. Now, I'm not saying he was perfect, but it, when we read his life in Scripture, we never see him retaliate. We never see him behave badly. We never see him even later when he has an opportunity to be in a place of power to ever go back to anyone who harmed him and harm them in retribu retribution or with a vindictive spirit. A man of integrity puts the past in the past and he moves forward. A man of integrity is whole and undivided in his loyalty to God, unimpaired in his obedience to God. Look, if you say, oh, I, oh, I, I, I obey God over here, and oh, I, I, I obey God over there, and I, I, I tithe, and I, I keep the Ten Commandments, and you know, I, I keep Sunday holy. But there are, are other things like you gossip and you slander, you deceive, you manipulate, you steal, you covet what someone else has. Then you need to be honest with yourself that you're not being obedient to God. A man of integrity seeks to be undivided in his loyalty to God. That means that he's even loyal to God when it costs him personally what he wants. Integrity is also internal consistency that protects one from being easily corrupted. Integrity is going to hold you accountable. And being held accountable is going to maintain your integrity. Because you're not going to dabble in gray areas. You're not going to say, well, no one will ever know. I'll go ahead and do this or say that. No. A man or woman of integrity knows that above all else, God always knows and I always know. I know when I'm compromising. I know when my attitude isn't right. I know when I'm having thoughts I shouldn't have. And I can choose to um, coax those things and to entertain thoughts I shouldn't have and to put my hand out or to grumble under my breath or to have a bad attitude. Well, you know, nobody hears. I keep it internally. Internally, it affects your spirit. And then it goes into your thought life. And what you think is internal is not so internal. It comes out in the way that you speak to people, in the way that you behave, in the way that you're easily offended, in the way that you like to pick a fight, and in the things that you say online that are slanderous and degrading to people, and I don't care what it was that they did. It isn't that people don't need to be held accountable because integrity doesn't look the other way when something you know evil is being done, but integrity doesn't take on a personal vendetta that's about me talking bad about you so that everybody sees you in a different light i'm accountable to god and there are things i take to god on my knees that i don't ever tell anybody else they happened because i'm not easily offended and i'm not easily wounded and because i don't want to compromise my integrity before god when there is a time to speak and there's something that needs to be said because it's important for people to know so that other people are protected and kept from being harmed, your voice will be stronger and your words will be more honest and they will be taken more seriously when you walk in integrity, when you're not the kind of person who's always talking bad about someone because then the power of your voice is compromised by the fact that people say, oh, they always have something bad to say about everybody. I don't know if we should really trust what they have to say about that person. But if you walk in integrity, your voice carries wisdom and discernment and you're led by the Spirit of God and, and your words have weight. People listen to what you have to say because they see the testimony of the Christ-like character in you and they know that whatever you're going to say, it's worth listening to. Amen? So last week we left off with Reuben losing his birthright and it being given to Joseph. Let's begin today before we get into the book of Genesis and look at the beginning of Joseph's life as a teenager. I, I want to start to share with you out of some different chapters in the book of Psalm. In a lot of ways, I think that some of what David battled to come into the fullness of the divine destiny that God had for him, 
could also speak to Joseph. We could literally take the words of David out of the book of Psalm and give them to Joseph and they would fit his situation perfectly. So over the next few weeks, I'm also going to be sharing with you in parallel to Joseph's life out of the uh, chapters of Psalms of uh, chapter 24, 25, and 26. So today we're going to begin with Psalm 24 verses 1 through 6. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? It is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to worship an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God. So Jacob's favorite was his son, Joseph. And because Joseph was his favorite, and because he could use the excuse that Joseph was now seen as the firstborn because of Reuben and his sin, uh, Jacob created a coat of many colors for Joseph. This is my own Joseph coat. Years ago, I preached about Joseph, and it was the very first time I was going to preach in a church that I didn't really know the people. And I'm a very visual person to begin with. And so my mom, very generously, I found the fabric. After looking all over the place, prayed and asked God, God, show me someplace. And the very next store we went to, we were like, aha, here's some fabric. And so my mom created the coat for me, and I've kept it all these years. And it always makes me think of Joseph's integrity. That even when Jacob was trying, um, maybe his motives were pure, you know, he loved his son greatly, but he wasn't thinking about his relationship with Joseph from a standpoint of integrity, because integrity would have held him accountable that said, look, even if you love Joseph the most, there's a line you can't cross, because now you're sending two messages. I love you the most. I love you all less. What we need to think about when we're thinking about integrity is, is there one message we're putting out or are there two messages? Are we preferring one person over someone else? Are we turning towards something while we turn our back on something else in a way that causes um, uh, confusion and separation and shame and criticism? We can't justify reaching for this while we're pushing that out of the way. And I hope that that's clear. I hope that that makes sense. That in a lack of integrity and a lack of wisdom, Jacob was telling Joseph, look, look, I love you so much. Here is this coat because you're my favorite, but also because you're the firstborn. But then at the same time, he was kind of driving a wedge between himself and his other sons. So integrity would have kept him accountable to realize that he couldn't play favorites that way because what he was also doing was driving a wedge not just between himself and his sons, but between Joseph and his brothers. And so Jacob gave him this coat. It says in Genesis 37, 1 through 11, Jacob dwell in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And um, Joseph was 17 years old. And he was out feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad uh, was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. Those were the two concubines, Leah and Rachel's concubine, who had also had uh, children by Jacob. And he was with their sons. And Joseph brought a report of evil to his father. His brothers were out and they were up to no good. And the integrity in Joseph went and told his father. He wasn't uh, tattling on them. It was something that needed to be brought to his father's attention. And so he was willing to risk the wrath of his brothers to show integrity, honesty, and loyalty to his father. And he told his father. Now, Israel, which remember is the other name for Jacob. God renamed Jacob Israel. So Jacob and Israel are the same person. Uh, Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his other children because he was the son of his old age. Also, uh, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not 
speak peaceably to him. Jacob's compromise in his integrity caused all of this confusion and anger and hatred in the relationship of his sons. So when we compromise our honesty, our loyalty to God, our total obedience, our consistency before God, there are repercussions. Maybe Jacob later thought better of what he had done, but the damage was already done. Satan is always looking for an opportunity to exploit when you behave badly. And let's face it, when Jacob showed favoritism like this to Joseph, he was behaving badly. He knew what he was doing, and yet he did it anyway. And so Jacob, uh, Joseph was hated by his brothers because of what Jacob chose to do. And it's not enough that God began to uh, show favor to Joseph through Jacob, but beyond this, God began to speak to Joseph about his divine destiny. Now, we don't see the other uh, ten brothers of Joseph, his older brothers, hearing from God, knowing God, being led by God, because they were not men of integrity, which their lives would show. It was only Joseph that God was speaking to, and it wasn't because he was the firstborn. It wasn't because he was his father's favorite. It's because he found in Joseph a man of integrity, honesty, and loyalty to God himself who was willing to receive from God his divine destiny and do everything that he could to walk that life out. And so Joseph had dreams just like his father had dreams and and joseph encountered god in those dreams just like jacob had encountered god and in joseph's dreams his first dream because he had to in his first dream he and his brothers were all out in the field and they were gathering grain and they each made a sheaf that's a, a bundle of grain, and it was tied together. And so every one of the brothers, all 11 of them, had a sheaf of grain. And Joseph's sheaf stood up in the middle, and the sheaves of grain of all of his brothers stood up around the outside, and their sheaves of grain bowed to his sheaf. And he told his brothers this dream. Now, some people have uh, suggested that Joseph did this because he was bragging. Or he did it to drive home to his brothers that he was the son of favor. He was the, the favorite of his father. But you know what? Your integrity will lead your story. And it will be the glass through which people will be able to see who you really are. We never see Joseph retaliate. We never see him behave badly. He was 17 years old. He was sharing what God was speaking to him to all of his older brothers Maybe for insight, maybe for validation, maybe for encouragement. But we see that Joseph, if he didn't want anything to do with his brothers, he wouldn't be telling them about his dreams. And we never see him say anything like he's jabbing at them or he's trying to show them that he's better than they are. We don't see anything in his language that alludes to that. We don't see anything in his life. See, when you have integrity, even when you have to tell people something they don't necessarily want to hear, your integrity is going to make your words something they're able to receive because they know that you're not harsh or vindictive, you're not angry, you're not trying to belittle them, that even when you have to tell them something hard for them to hear, it's for their benefit, it's for their help, and maybe even because you're seeking their insight, not because you're trying to create a problem, but because you're trying to unify. Joseph was trying to unify himself with his brothers, but unfortunately because they had no integrity and because of the state of their own hearts and lives, Satan was able to manipulate them and they hated him even more. Well, Joseph had another dream. And in this dream, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, the same as the number of brothers that Joseph had, bowed down before Joseph. And he told this dream to his brothers, and he also told it to his father. Now, initially, uh, originally, his father gave him a little bit of a hard time. But it says that in the end, Israel kept in mind that Joseph had had this dream. He didn't get on the bandwagon with Joseph's brothers and say, this is a bunch of garbage. Do you think that we're going to serve you? We're going to bow down to you? Because Jacob knew the integrity of Joseph. He knew he wasn't making this dream up. 
And he may not have fully understood the interpretation, but he was willing to take Joseph at his word that this was the truth of what God was showing him. So Joseph shared it with them all, and it says that his brothers were very jealous, and they hated him all the more. People who lack integrity will poke the dreams in your life. They will not be champions for the move of God in you, because in them, they're still struggling with what we talked about last week in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. They're still struggling with envy and with malice and deceit. And so when you share with someone else what God is speaking to you, what God wants to do in your life, and they're not able to encourage you and get on board and cheer God with you, in your integrity, you have to lay whatever they have to say aside and don't let it discourage you from believing that God has spoken. And from walking out everything that God has for you to walk out so that you can walk in the fullness of your divine destiny. Integrity will protect your heart from being discouraged and wounded by those who cannot be happy for what God wants to do in your life. And you know what? It, it also goes around the other way when you're someone who walks in integrity and you know what it looks like to have people not encourage you in your dreams. Remember that discouraging feeling don't carry it like a weight but instead let it be motivation that in your integrity you are always a champion for the dreams that God has for other people stir them up encourage them put your hand to help them if you can do whatever you can to champion others knowing remembering how it hurts sometimes when people don't uh, encourage and, and aren't happy for what God wants to do in your life it's always because of the state of their heart. And Joseph's brothers were not in a place where they could be pleased for him, that God would have a divine destiny for him, much less be pleased for him that it looked like somehow they were going to end up serving him. But we don't see Joseph talk about the dreams anymore because integrity, like I told you last week, also knows balance. He wasn't going to keep talking about the dreams because he knew that they hated hearing about it. When he realized that nothing good would come of talking to his family about the dreams, he kept them in his heart. He never forgot them. He walked in inter integrity in all that he did, and those dreams were part of the fuel that kept him accountable to God, knowing that if this is what God says about me, I know integrity will take me that place. Compromise won't. Deceit won't. Remember Rachel? trying every other way to get a child so that Jacob would be pleased with her. But it wasn't until she submitted herself to God that she really came into a place where God could work in her situation and take her to that place where her longing was really fulfilled. Well, Joseph wasn't bragging. He was just excited about what God wanted to do in his life. But because of his integrity, Jacob relied on him to tell him the truth when his brothers were behaving badly and also to keep an eye on his brothers when they might be getting into trouble. And so we see this week in the word of God in Genesis chapter 37 that Joseph's brothers went out to Shechem and they went out to take the flocks out to, uh, to pasture and they were about 50 hours away, so a couple days journey. And Jacob asked Joseph, oh, look, your brothers have been gone a while. Will you go out to Shechem and check on them and make sure everything's going well? You know, just see that they're all right and everything is going the way because he knew that Joseph would tell him the truth if he found that his brothers were up to no good. And so Joseph was in a place in his father's house of authority, authority over his brothers that he would be the one to check on them and make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. This hints to Joseph's divine destiny, that he was put in a place of authority, even though he was the youngest of those 11 brothers, because he could be trusted, because he was a man of integrity. Psalm 26, 1 through 3 reads this way. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. Even when all of Joseph's brothers rejected him and hated him, 
He left it with the Lord. He knew that the Lord would straighten it all out, and he said, bless me in my integrity, for I have walked before you and I've trusted you without wavering. Joseph kept his eyes on God. A man or woman of integrity knows that the promises of God are sure, and they have peace in their heart to walk every step without compromise, without divided loyalties, without being susceptible to being corrupted by outside forces. Joseph was not going to let his brothers trample down his dreams, but instead he was going to trust God to keep all of his promises as Joseph walked integrity before the Lord and in faithfulness. Romans 14.22 says this, The faith that you have, keep before yourself, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Joseph took the high road. Instead of complaining to God about his brothers and all the things that they were and were not doing, Joseph said, look at my heart, God. Look at my life. Correct me from my sin. A man or woman of integrity is not so concerned with what other people are doing that's wrong. But instead, they are putting themselves in the hands of God like David did and said, Search me, O God. Try me and know my heart. Show me if there's anything in me that doesn't please you. Joseph was saying, Look, God, I don't want to talk about what my brothers are doing wrong, where they are sinning. I want to be blameless before you. A man of integrity says, God, I'm the one that needs your grace. I'm the one who needs your approval. I'm the one who wants to be accountable to you. Even when no one else does, I won't make excuses. And I won't complain and I won't criticize. But instead, I'll look at my own heart. I'll look at my own life. And I will walk in total surrender to you because that's when things change. If you're out there trying to contemplate how you can get someone back, if something bad is happening to somebody and you just feel the little bit of, of happiness in your heart, uh uh-huh, they're finally getting what they deserve. Cut it out. That's not integrity. That's a division in your loyalties. You're actually playing into the hands of Satan because Satan's always happy when something bad happens to us. And he's often involved in it. But you walk in the integrity of your heart before God, blameless and harmless, so that God can work in your life. And so eventually God can also use you to work in the lives of those people around you who are behaving badly. If you don't show them a standard of a character of Christ to achieve and to, uh, uh, to move toward, to want to attain, what makes you any different than everyone else in the world? Everybody in the world can be nice on the right day. But the man or woman of integrity is always kind, always generous, always patient, because God in them makes the difference. We can never keep this up in our own strength. The minute something bad happened to us, we would fall all over the place. Our anger would rise up and, you know, things would come out of our mouth that have no business coming out of a mouth of a Christian. Don't compromise your integrity. Don't compromise the strength of your voice. Stand 100% for what is truthful. All the time I see people online and they post something. And it's 80% truthful. It's a powerful truth. But because it's put out by somebody in secular society, it's got profanity. It's got words that are degrading about someone. And so they simply brush it off by making a comment at the top that says, please excuse the profanity or please excuse the the harsh language or whatever. Look, if you have to make an excuse so that you can post something, you're already compromising your integrity. Why don't you create a new post with the 80% that's truthful and get rid of the garbage because you're compromising your loyalty to God. You're telling the world in the right circumstances, even Christians will swear. In the right circumstances, even Christians will gossip. In the right circumstances, even Christians will crush people with their words. Not a real Christian. Not a man or woman of integrity. We never see Joseph telling anybody anything bad about what other people had done to him. But instead, he kept his eyes on God because he saw the bigger picture. The picture is bigger than the person who offends you or hurts you or wounds you today. 
And once again, I'm not talking about not holding people accountable for breaking the law or for doing something evil. Because Joseph even went to his father and said when his brothers were doing evil things. But what I'm talking about is I'm talking about revenge. I'm talking about carrying something in your heart that wants to see somebody else destroyed and harmed because you've been harmed. You can't walk in integrity when your heart is fragmented by the things that have happened in your past. For you to be a man or woman of integrity, you have to have God's peace. And you have to have God's healing. And that means rejecting what Satan would try to use to destroy you. And instead walking in accountability to God in a way that protects your heart from being harmed. So Joseph went out to check on his brothers in the field. And when he got to Shechem, they weren't there. They weren't where they were supposed to be. And he countered a man in the field and he said, oh, they've gone on to Dothan, which is not that much further down the road. And so Joseph decided, because he promised his father he would bring him a report, that he would go and he would keep going until he reached where his brothers were. And while he was still a long way off, Joseph's brothers saw him coming. They probably saw that beautiful coat and recognized that it was him. And this is what they said. In Genesis 37, it says this. Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. Then we shall see what will become of his dreams. Remember that although Satan influences people, he is your real enemy. Satan had manipulated Joseph's brothers because of what was in their heart and in their lives to the point where they hated him so much that they were willing to take his life. Well, surprisingly enough, one of Joseph's brothers spoke out in his defense and said, we cannot do this thing. We cannot put our hands on our brother and shed his blood. And surprisingly enough, the brother that spoke out in his defense that said, let's throw him in a pit instead, instead of killing him and taking his life, was Reuben. Sometimes we will see people commit sin and behave badly, and God didn't want it. But God will use it to bring that person low so that he can start to work in their heart and in their life and bring them to a place where they want to know him and where they want to operate in integrity. Reuben, who had usurped his father's authority, acted out harshly in rebellion, who had criticized Joseph along with the rest of them. In this moment, he drew a line in the sand and he said, let us not kill our brother. Let us throw him in a pit instead. And if we read on in Genesis 37, we see that Reuben did not intend to leave Joseph in the pit, but instead he intended to come back and get him and to restore him safely to his father. Sometimes we will see someone we love fall and fall hard because of their sin. But no one is ever completely lost to God when they are still in this world. We are beginning to see that God was working in Reuben's heart and in his life. And so Reuben was able to use his influence as the oldest brother to convince his brothers not to kill Joseph. So when Joseph came in and he came close to his brothers, they stripped him of his beautiful coat of many colors and they threw him in a pit. And Reuben went back out to the field to check on the flocks and all the rest of the brothers sat down to have something to eat. And Joseph was sitting in the pit, and it said the pit was dry. There wasn't even any water in it. And some merchants came by on their way to Egypt. And Joseph's brother Judah said, Aha! Let's not take our brother's life, but let's profit from our brother. Let us sell him as a slave into these merchants' hands. And so that's what Judah did. All of his other brothers, yes, yes, they all agreed. So they sold Joseph into sa slavery. And when Reuben came back, he looked in the pit. And Joseph was gone, and he was greatly alarmed. And he tore his clothes like the Jews 
tear their clothes when they're going into extreme mourning, when someone has died or something really traumatic has happened in the Old Testament, we see someone tear their clothes in grief. And Reuben tore his coat in grief. And he came to his brothers and he said, the lad is no more. Where shall I go? He was overcome by grief because he didn't know yet what his brothers had done. But he knew that he was going to have to go back to his father and tell him that Joseph was gone. Well, Joseph's other brothers fessed up and they were left with a choice. Did they go after the merchants and try and get Joseph back? Did they go home and confess to their father? No. They did what men lacking real integrity will do. They tried to cover their sin with more sin. They killed a kid goat and they took the blood and they put it on Joseph's beautiful coat. And then they sent it back to their father with a message saying, we found this coat. Uh, does it look familiar? Is it perhaps the coat of your son? They were so deceptive and yet still so guilty because they sent the message. They didn't take it themselves because people who lack integrity, they also often will lack the um, fortitude to really be brass and bold in what they do. He, they knew it was sneaky. They knew it was underhanded. They knew it was deceptive and dishonest. Yet they couldn't look their father in the face and tell him the lie themselves. So they sent, they sent the coat back to him with this message. And when Jacob saw the coat covered in blood, he ripped his clothes and he went into desperate despair and mourning. When we lack integrity and we try and cover our sin, our sin spreads and it multiplies. And Joseph's brothers, in their attempt to protect their own reputations, destroyed their father. And it said that he could not be comforted, that he wept loudly and he would not rest. Let me tell you, people who lack integrity are able to numb the guilt and they're able to forget the conviction because all that matters is that they aren't made to be accountable for what they've done. But I tell you that just like Reuben's sin worked in his heart and began to change him, look, he went along with lying about Joseph being dead. I'm not saying he had arrived yet, but what I'm saying is, what Joseph's brothers did was horrible. But God began to use it to work in their hearts. No one is separated from God completely until they leave this world. We will see people do horrible and despicable crimes. Murder and, and rape and incest and things that are um, unfathomable that make us sick in the pit of our stomach. And I see people on the internet all the time and the things that they say should be done to these people in, in vengeance and rest and, and in, um, yeah, to, to not just hold them accountable, but to destroy them. And I tell you that I, I, I hate what they've done and I hate how they have harmed people and children. But at the same time in my heart, I know that God wants to see them brought to repentance. God wanted to bring Joseph's brothers to repentance and eventually to restoration. And in integrity, Joseph kept his eyes on God. Even when his brothers did this terrible thing to him, it could have destroyed him. Perhaps people have done things to you that are unspeakable, that Satan helps you will never recover from a man and a woman of integrity takes their heartbreak to God and God is able to do a healing he's able to do a strengthening he's able to bring up peace and he's able to bring you back from those hard and terrible places back into a right relationship with him back into a place of hopefulness back into a place where you realize that your life is not destroyed, that you still have a hope and a future in God. 
And so God was working through what Joseph's brothers did. Not that he liked it, not that he made it happen, not that he approved of it, to try and reconcile Joseph's brothers to himself, but also to try to position Joseph into the place of divine destiny that God had for him. It would be easy for Joseph to give up and to think that God had forsaken him when he was sold into slavery. But instead, just like in every other place that we've seen Joseph so far, Joseph kept his eyes on God. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted in you and wavered not. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind for your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in your faithfulness a man and woman of integrity understands that God is ever faithful that even when we are walking through terrible and challenging circumstances it does not mean that God has forsaken us if you learn to see God with you around you you will always see God in the midst of what's happening in your life. And integrity, you'll stay loyal to him, obedient to him, and have an expectation that as you stay honest and do what's right, that God will bring you out of that challenging place in victory and you will be even closer to the fulfillment, like Joseph, of all the dreams that God has for you. The unrighteous will cover their sin. They will wander from God. They will reject him completely. But when they see you walk in the integrity and the loyalty to God that is consistent, even that will give them hope for a different life. Reach out into the world and draw the lost and the broken to God by the integrity of in your heart and in your life. Show love to those who don't deserve it because when you do, you will show them that God has not forsaken them, God has not rejected them, and God is still close to them. The man of integrity does not want anyone to get what they deserve, but instead he realizes that first of all, I've not gotten what I deserved because Christ has covered my sins in his blood but he also has a desire for other people to be reconciled to God and have their sins covered in his blood too. Well, that's all the time that we have for this week. Join us next week when we see Joseph arrive in Egypt in a new season, but Joseph is still the same man of integrity, keeping his eyes on God and expecting God to give his best as he is always faithful. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. We look forward to studying the Word with you again next time. In the meantime, if you want to check out any of our other video teachings, podcasts, daily devotional blogs, or to access the Melissa Silvis Ministries event calendar, you can friend us on Facebook at Melissa Silvis or at Melissa Silvis Ministries to the Nations with Love. You can also check out more information about our ministry by going to melissasilvis.com. May God bless you as you continue to seek Him every day.